phone in. Um, but no, that was a that was a nice uplifting track. Um, now it's uh, eleven fifteen. Um, as I mentioned, we are going to be speaking to a junior doctor. Um, now we have done loads of debates about the junior doctor strikes that took place uh, over across this year, actually, and uh, a few weeks ago, um, junior doctors uh, voted to reject the government's new proposed contract, and uh, the terms and conditions were put to them following talks between the British Medical Association and the government back in May. Members of the BMA voted against the new arrangements by 58 to 42 percent. The revamp contract included several changes, including a reduction in the basic pay rise and weekends, um, and weekends no longer being divided up between normal and unsocial hours. Now, one junior doctor who did not accept that government contract is Rishi Deer. Rishi is an orthopaedic surgeon at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital in London and uh, it's fair to say, isn't it, Rishi, you've become so angry with the situation that you've actually decided to turn to music. Yeah, so I thought, th- first of all, thank you very much for having me on no, this morning. it's a pleasure yeah. to have you here. Um, I, uh, so for me, I thought that, you know, we needed to get this message out about the contract, essentially why it's unsafe and unfair. I need to get people to stand up. And I thought, what's the best way of getting that message out quickly and effectively? Now, the public, I felt, were almost a bit fatigued with junior doctor strikes, with Brexit, things like that. So for me, I've got um, a a background interest in music. And I also found that it's a really good way of expressing my emotions, of articulating those. So Mm. I approached Dave Randall through a family friend who's um, uh, the guitarist from Faithless. He's been with them for 15 years. And Dave's quite politically minded as well. And um, he sort of got on board with the whole ideal. And I, I just felt that a really good song is a really good way of getting a message out there very quickly and effectively about the problems of this contract, which essentially has just been repackaged but has all the same problems that existed before. Well, you say, I suppose, has been repackaged. The BMA actually recommended that junior doctors vote in favour of it because it was a negotiation. So now what, what I have to just, just correct you on mm. there, Sheetal, is but so a lot of the spin that's been coming out is that the BMA recommended it. What right. the BMA did was they negotiated some terms and conditions. They didn't recommend anything. They actually themselves maintained a neutral stance throughout and mm. then said they would put it to a referendum of their members. Johan Malawana, who was the previous head of the um, junior doctors contract committee, he was in favour of the contract, but he spoke separately to what his committee suggested. So the the position of the committee and the BMA was to remain neutral, and I have to Hmm. actually accentuate that, because that hasn't really been coming out through the press. That's right, you're you're right. The sort of spin from the government has been basically, you know, the BMA put this contract forward, they accepted it, the junior doctors are still rejecting it, therefore I'm going to impose. That's never been the position of the BMA. The BMA were just basically went to the negotiation table, said, okay, Mm. this is what we've got, we are now going to put it to our members, and the members voted by quite a significant margin to reject that. Which is, which is quite which is a, a huge a, amount, it's actually. It's quite a huge amount as well. Yeah. What is next then? I mean, I know that you're obviously here to talk about this single and, yes. and the music, but we can't not speak to you about the current situation. Absolutely. Because... Are we in stalemate at, at the moment? I mean, uh, is there a prospect of further strikes? Well, I think I think before I come on to that, I think I've got to just, in, in four words, sort of say to the public about what the main problems of this contract are, just to sort of show people why it's important. Mm. So number one, whistleblowing. This contract doesn't protect junior doctors. If they see a problem with patient safety, they want to report it. It allows them to be dismissed very easily, and that has happened in a number of cases. Number two, safeguarding. Junior doctors are allowed to be overworked, and the safe cards that they had where hospitals would be fined for that have been taken away so tired doctors make mistakes number three um discrimination women and less than full-time trainees people with disabilities who take time out of medicine they're not pay protected anymore either and then number four it's it's a model which is not costed at all so for example the government talks about this myth of a seven-day nhs they mean a seven-day elective NHS, but they're selling it to the public as a seven-day emergency NHS, i.e. if you come in at a weekend, you won't get seen by a doctor. If you have a heart attack, you won't get seen. Now, we know from our own experience, if you come in to a and at midnight, mm. two in the morning, you always get seen by a doctor. Emergency NHS has always been seven days. With an elective NHS, the NHS is multidisciplinary, so it requires funding to be put in. The government won't put any funding in. So they're just stretching doctors to unimaginable levels so that the service fails. And that's what we're fighting for. If people say, look, 
why should I care? You know, the whole country's on fire, junior doctors, it's a small issue. It's never been a junior doctor issue. This is an issue about the NHS, which the public, which you, which me, which our families use every single days of our lives. This contract is going to push through privatisation and the destruction of that NHS, and that's why everybody needs to get engaged in this and interested in this. Uh, I mean, I suppose the question, and, and it has been debated a lot, we'll, yes. we'll, we'll talk about privatisation in a second, sure. but I, I just want to go into the nitty gritty of what a seven day NHS means. Yes. The government is saying that they want many more surgeries open. And I don't just mean mm. GP surgeries, I'm talking about, you know, other, other surgeries within hospitals open seven days a week. Mm. So that could be orthopaedics, which yes. is your area. Yes. It could be uh, gynaecology or sure. something like that. Um, why is there such, I suppose, opposition that these clinics or surgeries would also be open on at the weekends, for example? So there's not opposition, but I'm actually one of these people who, you know, is actually in favour of a seven-day NHS mm. if it is funded and costed correctly. So what I mean by that is the government have basically taken a paper which has now subsequently been rubbished, which said that there are higher death rates on weekends, OK? So they're talking about emergencies. Mm. But in terms of electives, to fulfil an elective service, they have concluded we must increase the number of junior doctors and therefore we can open these clinics. But the, we know that the NHS is multidisciplinary. Every week, I cancel three patients because we don't have enough beds available. Right. Okay? I cancel patients because we don't have enough theatre space available. Mm. I cancel patients because we don't have enough nurses available. So if you said to me, okay, Rishi, there's 30 patients, there's 30 beds in the ward, I want to do 300 extra operations this weekend, you'd cancel 270 operations. Mm. You need funding in lots of different areas. So what by just increasing the number of junior doctors by cutting their wages down by stretching them to tired proportions you're not going to fulfill the seven day service so if you asked a government minister could you cost out what a seven day nhs actually means they couldn't do it i could cost it for you in five minutes i could draw a spreadsheet because i've worked in it and because i know what and a seven that, day has NHS that happened entails. at all in these negotiations no that's what happens we've been asking from the start well what do you mean by a seven day nhs define it to the mm. public they won't define it what do you mean by it what costs are required all they keep saying is it's a cost neutral envelope do you know what I mean? Mm. So if how how cost can you neutral how, so what that means is they don't want to spend any more. So how can you then introduce all these extra services without any funding? How is that possible? Right, and that's the point so I'm trying think, to get across. Do you think the so, government has been so that's where the uh, very secretive oh, as absolutely. to what the actual plans are? Absolutely, and this is where you're talking about privatisation, and that's what I mean as well. Because what you do is by stretching a service until it breaks, until breaking point, by constantly putting stories out that you know this person has died, this misfortune, mm. this much, no no positive stories about the NHS. Mm. You create the impression of a service that's failing, or you push a service towards failure, and it then makes it much more attractive for private companies to come in. We can already see it happen. There's things which have been sold off to Virgin Care, etc., etc. Mm. Now, what are some of the problems with privatisation? Well, the problems is the healthcare has never been about profit, whereas privatisation is about mm. profit. And secondly, quality control. With privatisation, you often don't have any auditing of accounts. You don't have any sort of quality control of the actual service itself because you don't have national commissions coming in, whereas we do with the National Health Service as well. OK. Well, look, Rishi, I, I, I just want to bring you some news because uh, the BBC understands that uh, Jeremy Hunt, uh, the Health Secretary, has not been sacked, but uh, it's understood he will be getting another job within the Cabinet. Um, but... It, the fact that he's been moved, if you like, um, uh, from his current role mm -hmm. as health secretary. What are your thoughts on that? I think my thoughts really are, it was sort of expected. Um, I has he been a good health secretary? No, well, I mean, I, I personally don't think he has. The reason I don't think he has is because I think a lot of his language has been quite inflammatory and toxic as well. I think he hasn't taken the time to sit down with health professionals and actually work out what a seven-day NHS has, has involved, what it entails. Mm. And I feel that he's inflamed the situation at certain times. However, I think we have to think bigger than Jeremy Hunt. I've always said this. That Who do you think should get the job then? Personally, I want somebody who's actually going to... I, don't, I can't pick a name out for you right now because I don't know a lot of them what their backgrounds mm. are in healthcare as well. It would be very useful to have somebody who had some sort of background in that area so they understood what it entailed. Well, it's interesting that Dr Liam Fox has never been health secretary, mm. yet he's a, he's a former GP. I mean, uh, yeah, it's, an, it's unusual that he's not gone with it. But, but as I said to you, I would want to know exactly what their background is. I'd want somebody who would actually engage with health care professionals rather than using terms like imposition. But I have to keep reiterating the point that it, this is bigger than Jeremy Hunt. It's never been about Jeremy Hunt versus the junior doctors. His He was just a figurehead for his 
orders coming from above. If the new health secretary comes in and still maintains the stance of imposition of the same contract, then nothing has changed whatsoever. So um, it doesn't really change anything for me. It was completely expected. I suppose if junior doctors have heard noises of other cabinet ministers or other ministers, in fact, who... I suppose, uh, have a different tone uh, yes. in terms of language. Yes. I mean, uh, many people would say that they didn't expect Jeremy Hunt to be so inflammatory. Um, and that's an opinion that many junior doctors hmm. have certainly come forth hmm. with. But hmm. is it is it that, look, absolutely, every organisation, every system needs reform. And actually, maybe junior doctors, or doctors in general, need to accept that... You know, for the NHS, it's got ring-fenced funds, that kind of thing. It's it's always been protected. It's loved by the public. But reform is absolutely necessary. And maybe if junior doctors weren't so um, stridently against reform of services, that actually it would be easier to, to manage changes, changes in population, changes in people living longer, that kind of thing. But then, um, Sheila, what it is, is it's about what type of reform. I've worked in the NHS now for 10 years. I'm a senior registrar, so I'm almost at the end of my junior doctor training. Mm. So I've seen reformers right throughout my training, which we've completely grasped and embraced. We've seen the digital reform, for example, Mm. all notes going paperless. We've seen about the change in our on-call and our working patterns. So we've gone more from a um, a sort of 24-7 type of on-call where you're attached to teams to more of a shift-based system. I've seen both of those systems. Junior doctors and consultants and nurses have never been reticent about technology, never been reticent about reform as well, Mm. but it's what the type of reform is. As I said to you before, I go back to, is this truly a seven-day NHS or is this the myth of a seven-day NHS to make it more attractive towards privatisation? I would tend to agree with the latter. Mm. So, as I said to you, I've never been against a seven-day NHS, but it needs to be funded and costed properly. And I think if you speak to most junior doctors as well, they're not reticent against that. They're not against reform at all. My plan, if I go forward as a consultant, would Mm. be to take some of these things on. But again, you need to work with the healthcare professionals, not work against them as well. Just... um Rishi, I'm really interested in hearing from, I suppose, what sort of impact it's had on patients, because Mm -hmm. we're now, you know, sort of two months on from the last strike, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, And was that level of support from patients still there? Because I think you ultimately you held about six strikes, was it this year or was it? So we had um, (coughs) two back in January and February. I think I would think it was five or six. Five or six. Yeah. Was was. Was there still support from patients? Uh, I mean, so I actually was only on strike on the last day because I was actually working in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So my experience of talking to patients who came in was they were very supportive throughout during the strikes. Um, And even afterwards as well, people keep saying, you know, you're doing a great thing for us. Mm. First of all, safety. So no patient was compromised at all. Patients were immediately seen by a consultant. If anything, they were probably seen quicker Mm. um, by a very experienced person. Patients were inconvenienced and that that is a tragedy and that's something that none of us ever wanted to do in terms of appointments being cancelled. But as I've said to you already, I cancel three patients a week because of lack of beds, because Mm. of rotor gaps, because of funded shortages. That's been going on for years and years and years on end. There's a bigger picture here and that's what we're fighting for as well. We could just say, yeah, you know what, let's accept the contract, let's drive it through. In a year, there won't be the same NHS anymore and some of those public who are already being affected won't be able to afford. What's your biggest fear about the NHS, especially in light of Brexit, in light of how things have changed on the political scene literally within three weeks? Mm -hmm. What's your biggest fear? What what's, you know, what are junior doctors really talking about? Their fears about the NHS, about their jobs, about this contract? My fears, Mm. gosh, that's a that's a good question, personally. Um I think I think one thing you might lose, which I'm worried about, is the goodwill of staff. I think the NHS survives a lot on goodwill of staff. I mean, people staying three hours late every day, you know, every day, every week, people going the extra yard, people going that. If you treat people with such an amount of disdain, you'll get a situation where people just clock in and clock out. Mm. You get to five o'clock, I'm scheduled to finish at five o'clock, there's ten patients waiting in the waiting room sorry, clinic's over, you'll lose that goodwill. Mm. That's one fear. Second fear is that you will get a brain drain as well. I think a lot of these professionals, many who have £100,000 in debt, who are well-trained professionals, worked extremely hard, they'll feel underappreciated, undervalued, and they will go to places like Australia and Australia, New Zealand. It will lead to a massive drop in the service quality, and that will impact and on... And do you know people that have left? Absolutely, yes. I know many who have left as well. And is it just because, what, doctors 
going abroad feel as if they're much more respected? Well, it's it's respected, it's valued as well. It's in terms of, you know... I turn that question back rather than saying, oh, they value I say, why would you stay in the current system? Why would you stay? I, I'm, I'm 35. I'm almost at the end of my junior doctor training. But if I was a junior doctor at the start, I would say to them now, well, why would you stay in the current climate mm. with you being treated like this? Why would you? When you have options available, when you don't have family, why would you stay? That's interesting. This is a WhatsApp message that uh, somebody has sent us. No name on it. Uh, if you want to do the same, you can do so. 07920 500 200. You can text me as well, 81869, or you can email nihal at bbc.co.uk. Here's the message. This guy is 100% right. The NHS is being privatised right before our eyes, but the public have been hypnotised. Patient lists are almost doubled per, per, per physician. They can't come out and say we're dissolving the NHS because there would be uproar. It's being engineered to collapse. This isn't reform. We work in the organisation and know what's happening. You would echo that absolutely, view, wouldn't absolutely. you? Absolutely. Um, I mean, it sounds like somebody who actually works in it and has seen that yeah. themselves. Every every day we get, you know, where doctors, the system is being put under more and more strain. So more patients being, for example, in orthopaedics, being put into a fracture clinic. Hmm. I've worked in places where three doctors are covering 130 patients in three hours. Uh, how is that good quality care? Spending two, three minutes a patient. How is that good quality care? Hmm. Do you know what I mean? I, I've worked in situations where lists are being packed to their absolute max. People are being put under strain and you are desperate because you're so worried about making a mistake as well. And they are just engineering the system for collapse. Nobody wants to be the government who says explicitly, I privatise the NHS. However, by creating a system which is destined to collapse and has lots of faults in it, then they may say to you, oh, well, Sheetal, you know, you're having a horrible time in the NHS, but down the road, we've got Virgin Healthcare who can offer this to you for £200. It's pounds. not just Virgin Healthcare, or, or we should Virgin, say, because they're not here to defend Sorry, it. sorry. So, or, but there or, are or, other or, or healthcare, like private healthcare yeah. companies that are providing Sorry, sorry I should have used a generic that's right, there. But, that's okay. but, uh, but that's what I'm saying to you, is that, you know, <laughs> offering a, another alternative if you if you create a system which is engineered to collapse that alternative then looks palatable mm. whereas it didn't before does that make sense so. uh I suppose. But, yeah. you know, I suppose we're, we're not just talking about, as you said, you mentioned one company, but there's plenty of other Absolutely. privatised companies that are actually providing, if you like, um, a, a clear up of that backlog. And I, yeah. and I talk about things like uh, MRI scans yes. or, um, you know, sort of x-rays and that kind of thing, which um, in the area that I live in, in East London... Um, it's much easier. Uh, yes. You can go on a Saturday or a Sunday, um, so I don't have to take time out of work. Sure. Because, quite frankly, it would take too long oh, if no. I was to do it in a hospital. Um, so those things are alleviating mm -hmm. pressures on mm -hmm. hospitals, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And that's that's a public-private partnership deal. Uh, have you seen some of the quality of those scans that they send over privately? Uh, Personally, I haven't. I mean, I'm so, not a doctor, so, so... So what I'm saying is some of the quality control is <clears throat> not there. I, I personally have seen a lot of patients who come with their scans, mm. I, I won't name the company, but who come in and actually the quality of those scans is not up to scratch. Right. That you're not able to make the diagnosis. So often those have to be repeated. Right, I see. So either the quality is not there, they're not transferred over properly. I mean, that's just a small small, small mm. area. But even that is an example of how quality control is not necessarily there all so the time. So I suppose us raising so, this as an issue yeah. is I'm, as the patient, sure. would say, oh, well, it's great because it's, it's great. More, much more convenient for me. But then can I actually use the scan that you're getting yeah. to make my diagnosis? Yeah. It, 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 so, and, and that's just one small example. That's one small example. But mm. I have to keep reiterating the point. I am not against progress. I am not against a seven-day NHS. You know, orthopaedics is one of those specialties which has moved on through technology and it moves on every single day. You know, mm. we use, we're using the digital age. We use apps. We use things in our surgery. We use things in our clinics. We use paperless notes and that's great. Electronic mm. stuff is great. But as I said, I think this is not a true seven-day NHS. And uh, all of those four points that I mentioned in the contract, I think those still exist. And I think you, if you worked in a contract where you didn't have, you had discrimination for being a woman, where yeah. you didn't have whistleblowing protection, where you didn't have safeguarding, all those three things, you wouldn't accept that. So why would it be accepted in healthcare? Yeah, we, we spoke to some uh, to some junior doctors um, a few months ago who said that um, in real terms, they would potentially with this new contract see a 25% reduction in their in their annual income. Yeah, that's true. 
uh, which would mean that, you know, the the woman in this, they were both doctors um, and because of childcare and that kind of thing, it would make no absolutely no sense for her to go back to work, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, even though she's trained for 10 years yeah, um, exactly. to be a surgeon. I go back to that thing that I said, why would you do it? Why would you stay under those terms? Rishi, can you explain to us, um, there's something that came up quite a lot uh, pre-referendum, actually, and it's something that I think our listeners would be quite interested in. Um, Whether you can tell us about the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, um, is that something that you can explain to us? I'll be honest with you, I don't know a lot about it in a lot of detail, but I think it's about, um, so it's a partnership that they did with the with the US, and I think it was about uh, sort of making certain aspects of healthcare and other parts of uh, society mm. sort of more more attractive for privatisation and be, be able to sell those off, but I couldn't go into it into a lot of okay. detail. Okay, no, be no, absolutely, honest absolutely there. no problem. Let's talk a little bit then about this, we'll go back to your single, single the, yes. the, your, your track, <laughs> uh, which we were having a look at because the uh, the video is up on YouTube. Yes, it went live last night. It so. did, it, it did, and it, and it's quite, you know, it's a bit tongue-in-cheek, yes. isn't it? It's yeah. a bit funny. Um, it's called Stand Up. Yeah. Um, and if you were, if you want to watch it on YouTube, it's Stand Up and Dr. Dr. Rishi. Rishi. So that's my artist name. Okay. Okay, and then yeah. it comes up. It's it does. Kind of, yeah. yeah, just it's, I think it's the second video. It is. It? it is like a purplish sort of a background yes, icon. So. That's right. Now tell us about this. We, we are going to listen to it in a bit, actually. Fantastic. But this is. I mean, you are, I suppose, taking the Mickey, but actually, it's it it's actually got a very serious message. Yeah. Yeah. So with the video, because I directed the video as well, I I thought the actual context of the song is very serious lyrically musically as well so i thought with the video i wanted something almost a bit quirky to grab mm. people's attention it's quirky yeah. yeah it's not it's not so much taking the mickey i so to speak but there's a lot of imagery in there which yeah. i think is quite strong imagery so for example there's a resuscitation scene which which is an image for the resuscitation of the nhs yeah which is kind of comes back to life and it's about fighting back it's about a song of solidarity it's about sticking together and it's about about how even the single smallest man woman child can actually do something as well mm. people ask me well what's the point of doing it through music what's the point i think music people say you know a a picture can paint a thousand words. I think a great song can paint a thousand messages. I think it's a great way of getting a message out there. And um, a large swathes of political campaigns have been fought on the back of musical mm-hmm. tracks. You can look at songs such as John Lennon's Imagine. You can look at Marvin Gaye, What's Going On. Great pop tunes, but mm-hmm. actually very political songs as yeah. well, if you listen to their lyrics. Yeah. So what my thinking was is, how do I grab the public's attention? People will listen to it. It's a great summer tune. It's a feel-good tune. But actually, if you listen to the lyrics closely, what is it saying? And it's a much better way of getting people to think. I just want to engage people. Look, I'm not going to be pretentious and say a song is going to change change the world. Of course it's not, but a song can get people engaged and people mm. can change the world. Well, I say NHS choir. Who'd have thought that they would have had the Christmas number one and, you know, a, a massive, what is it, platinum and selling exactly. album as well. Exactly. Why? Because there is that sort of, I suppose, that love and connection to Absolutely. people associated with the NHS. Yeah. Um, the, the proceeds from this are going to charity? That's correct, yes. Uh, which charity? So so at the moment I'm going to be donating the proceeds to Care2, but also a num- number of other charities as well. So because it's a political track, charities, I can't really name them specifically, yeah. but it's going to be charities that I choose those. That's fair enough. Okay. Well, um, I think, I mean, if, if you want to watch it, you can watch it on YouTube. Yes. And, uh, and it, download it on iTunes, download it on Juno, um, downloads.com, please. I really want people to download it because if we can get it out there, get it charting, it can really get the message out there. And it's it's a really positive song. Just have a listen. I think you'll love it. Um, yeah, it could be this summer's summer's tune. I you hope. never know. You <laughs> never know. My goodness, it, it could well be. It just needs uh, maybe a little bit of a remix for Ibiza. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk are about that. Are you offering? <laughs> <laughs> well, my musical days are over, I think. Um, Dr. Rishi Dear, thank you very much for coming in. Thanks, uh, we can now uh, listen to the track. Great. Stand up. No.
It's not safe, not fair, but they just don't 